Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the next Foreman Community Demo and a slightly less sunny uh, Scotland than last time, but it's okay. Um, you know, I was doing some statistics recently on whether Scotland has good weather, and the short answer is actually yes, even though nobody believes me. I'll publish it sometime. It'll be great. But that's not what this demo is about. So let's uh, let's get started. Before we go any further, though, the usual reminders. Uh, do update the quality on your stream if it isn't already at a decent quality or it's really difficult to read the text from all the various presenters. Um, and if you've got questions you want to join in, then uh, hit up IRC, hash the foreman, or, or you can join us on Matrix as well. Um, or you can drop questions into the YouTube live chat. I'm watching both of those places. And uh, and you can interact with us and let us know what your questions are, or what your comments are. Okay, so what do we got today? We got um, a few people talking about infrastructure updates, not just me for once. Uh, so we've got a few few things to cover there. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about one eighteen. We were one of my presenters can't make it unfortunately. We've got some updates uh, on the subscription and other Catello-ish things. And we've got some proposals from Marek who wants some feedback. So this is one of those rare instances where we're showing something that's not merged yet. So. Caution, <laughs> but we want some feedback. So, uh, so your opinions on that very much wanted. Um, talking about one point eighteen, uh, that is being cut right now, I believe. Uh, Toma and Andre are working on it uh, right away, uh, so you should see packages for that in the next day or two. And uh, so, very exciting. Um, the appointment of Toma as the as the release manager is already having quite the impact among the development team, uh, and things things seem to be getting going again. So, this is this is really really good. Uh, so watch the uh, release announcements category on the forum, um, or obviously the usual places like Twitter, or you can pick up our RSS feed, uh, all that kind of good stuff. But yes, 1.18 will be out very soon. And as always, thanks very much to everyone for their testing and feedback uh, during the, the release candidate process. It's always hugely appreciated. Uh, and you guys are what make it possible for us to do this stuff. So thank you very much. Talking about other events, uh, next week is our ninth birthday, or rather, this week is our ninth birthday. It's actually tomorrow, 13th of July is the first commit to Foreman. Um, but we have a birthday party next week being hosted by our good friends at ATEX. Uh, so if you haven't already seen that, you can find details on the forum. And indeed, it's on the front page of our website at the moment as well. So just head over to theforum.org and you can pick up the details. Uh, so that will be uh, at, at ATEX's offices in Germany. Uh, so if you're in the area, head along, say hi, have a beer. We're also going to be at DevConf India. Our, our people over in Pune are, are, are sorting out our booth and stickers and a demo and all the usual good conference stuff. So if you're in that part of the world and you haven't had a chance to meet up with some of the Foreman team, then then get yourself over to DevConf India. It should be good fun. Um, again, back to ATIX. They're going to be, I, th I think I said this last time as well, but I'm just keeping it in there. Uh, in August, they'll be at FrostCon in Germany as well. So Lukas was going to talk a little bit about um, how we did with the 1.18 test week. I'm going to let him cover that next time. Sadly, he's uh, he's not been able to make it today at short notice, which is unfortunate. Uh, but um, I just wanted to highlight that we did have a, a 1.18 test week, and it was pretty cool. Uh, I don't know exactly what Lukas was going to say about it, but from my perspective, watching that kind of organization come together and watching people test out um, you know, the big scenarios that need the, the sort of things we can't easily do in CI, right? That work through certain workflows, make sure they work properly, and then check them off. It was really nice to see that happening, and I think we're likely to do it again. Uh, so, uh, my thanks to Lukas for, for organizing that, and I'm looking forward to hearing how he felt it went. Uh, but sadly, we can't hear that today. So, with that, uh, we'll move straight on, and we're going to talk about the new subscriptions page. Walden, is your microphone working this week? Yeah, but only because I'm using OS X instead of Linux. Oh, yeah. We'll fix that. We'll fix that at some point. But at least, <laughs> at least you're with it. So, so show us what you couldn't show us last time. All right. So um, this is the new subscriptions page written in React and Redux. Uh, we're replacing our old Angular page with this. Um, this currently is in Nightly, but there is a bug preventing um the page from loading that we're looking into uh so i'm gonna have to demo from master instead or yeah master um and so when you first come to this page you see this uh empty state display here um and then you add you can add subscription red hat subscriptions by uploading a manifest and I just realized I don't have my manifest on this computer, but you upload it here uh, and it shows um, a little progress bar here. And then I'll do the whole cooking show thing and pull out the, the 
uh, the done pie out of the oven. Um, here I'm apparently uh, showing you that we have uh, uh, a display for errors here. Um, but uh, you here see a list of all your uh, Red Hat subscriptions. Um, they're uh, the ones that are uh, grouped that have the same um, same SKU uh, are grouped here. You can uh, you can um, see the details of these subscriptions. Um, you can uh, delete them, which is kind of uh, atypical. But if you wanted to, you could delete subscription here. Um, I'm not going to do that at the moment. We have uh, export CSV functionality, so you can download all these in uh, CSV format for your perusal. Um, there is the ability to um, to manage the manifest here by either deleting it entirely or refreshing it. Uh, we show in here also the manifest uh, action history here. Um, so you can see uh, what's happened with this manifest. Um, and the big, the big change from the old page to this new page is that we are now adding the ability to um, to alter your subscriptions from the Red Hat portal directly in uh, satellite now. So if I came in here and say I wanted to add some more of these subscriptions here, can do that. Scroll down here, click submit. And it uh, will add these to my list of local subscriptions on the satellite or on the, on, excuse me, on the Catello. <laughs> um, this progress bar within the table is kind of a new concept that we've brought in with this too, uh, that we want to spread out into other, other areas of the application instead of uh, just linking to form and task or something like that. Um, so people can see their progress uh, in real time. This action uh, prevents the editing of all this other stuff, as you can see here. Um, I guess some sort of warning, but uh, it completed. Um, here's a link to the directly to the task page. Um, kind of standard functionality here with autocomplete search and stuff um, like we have on other pages. Uh, and a big, a big benefit of this, uh, all this work is, is that since it's written in React and we've created some new components that uh, can be reused um, as we start converting other pages to, to React. Um, and also, uh, we've contributed substantially to Patternfly React in this process as well. Um, so I think that's about all I wanted to show. Uh, so uh, if there's any questions, I'll, I'll field those. Sure. I think um, I really like that progress bar. Just, just to make sure I'm understanding this correctly. So that's still firing the tasks off via form and tasks in the background, but you're just hooking into the output that you'd see on the tasks page anyway. And yeah, that's, that's, right. that's exactly right. Um, let's see, where is it? Monitor task. Um, I'll just show that. Yeah, see, here's the, the mm. task. Yeah. yeah, that's just a way to like update it without having to go to a new page, just so you can see what's going on. That's really nice. and presumably because of that. Then, if you were to if you were to go away from a page and back to the page while the task is still in progress, you would still see that grayed out, and you know, with the progress bar being still displayed. Yeah. I'll try to I'll try to demonstrate that. Um, because refresh manifest is kind of a longer. Yeah, yeah so you navigate away. 
cool. Oh, that is beautiful. I love that. Yeah. So, so that way, yeah, we don't, we could, well, all, unfortunately what we're doing here is just pulling the, the task API. Ideally we do something like a web socket or something like that. Um, because, you know, polling is sure. Sure. It's yeah. not ideal, but still from a UI perspective, that is really lovely. Um, because I think that's something we've had a problem with like, the form and task is essentially invisible to most people. Right. So, um, yeah. yeah, I think that's really nice. If, uh, if nothing else, that, that we need to reuse something like that in quite a lot of places. Um, so, yeah. yeah very and this hopefully, hopefully will pave the way for that. Um, there are some things that are currently in Catello now. Some of these components are still in Catello, and they should be uh, uh, moved into Foreman um, mm -hmm. over the next probably months. Uh, and then they can be uh, reused everywhere uh, in Foreman. Very cool. Very cool. I mean, there's so much we could move to that kind of model, particularly once you've got that kind of feedback. Like in, in my head, I mean, I'm, I don't, something like, for example, a puppet class import can take forever, right? If you've got a heck of a lot of puppet classes, so like being able to, and that isn't using form and task at the moment, just to, just to be clear. I don't think so anyway. Um, but we could like offload that, right? And then get the status back and actually show you the what classes to import later and it can take like for, i know from some users that can take like 10 minutes to import puppet classes um, right. so and at the moment it locks the whole instance right so yeah um would be nice to have that kind of progress and that kind of ability in other places as well cool um i'll just have a look see if there's any other questions um yes uh i don't oh uh Right, yeah. So I had asked the same question as me about can you leave while you're watching it, which we've already done. Um, so that's, I think, the only question. Um, let's move on, I guess. Right. So hopefully, uh, Zach, I'm going to go back to my slides here. Yep. Um, you're here. Good. Fantastic. I yeah. see you in. The, I see you in the chat like like four times at the moment. So <laughs> you've been oh, in and out. Please. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. No, it's fine. I just want to make sure I get the right one. Um, yeah. So. Um, Nightly testing methods. Is this about CentOS CI? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, so should I just screen share and? Yeah, please do. Okay. All right. Ah, there you are. Hey everyone. Um, just to give you a little brief introduction about myself, my name is Zach, um, and I work a lot on uh, our release team for Catello. And so, um. Some of the things that we also do is we do a lot with um, our CI, CD upstream and downstream. And so um, I wanted to kind of show you guys some efforts that we've been making recently on trying to uh, increase our integration testing. And so um, this, the first kind of step we've taken to this is uh, we've upgraded our Catello nightly release test um, to now, instead of using Rackspace, which is what we were using before, um, we are now using our the CI CentOS.org. And so what this kind of lets us do is um, we get a bit of a, a larger amount of uh, hardware to work on so that um, we don't run into kind of any sort of out of memory errors or whatnot. Um, and so I just wanted to demonstrate that it look is going to look the same as it did before on our uh, CI uh, for the foreman.org. Um, the only difference is, is that when we're doing the install test, we're actually calling to another foreman uh, job on CICentos.org, um, and we are uh, running it right here and just kind of doing the same things. Um, some of the advantages that we are immediately getting out of this is that we are running it on, or that we are also testing for uh, smart proxies. Um, while we're running this pipeline. And so we're getting a little bit more data on what's actually working or whatnot. Um, the other nice part about this is that um, this can actually be run locally as well. All you have to do is go to forklift and run um, the pipeline that we're running and you can get the same results as this is going to have except locally and you can try it out. Um, but we're also caching all of the bats tests that we're running and uh, getting a sauce report in case it fails or something like that. Um, but I also wanted to just plug that um, this is, we're also just trying to increase our integration testing in general. And so um, I've also made a forum post 
talking about this and wanting to kind of engage the community more and seeing what y'all want to um, see tested more if we're testing a plugin that you want to or we're not testing a plugin that you want to see or something like that um, this is something that we're trying to start ramp up, ramping up on and uh, we would really appreciate any like feedback or uh, PR is welcome so yeah uh, I just wanted to let people know cool I love that phrase. PR's welcome. Community manager's equivalent of get off your lazy ass. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but this is awesome stuff. Um, I, so, so just in line me, what what are the sort of capabilities of the the CentOS cloud? Can we do? Can we get like a whole subnet and do like pixie testing and stuff? Um, I am not totally sure about that, but I imagine that um, if you were able to create a create some sort of uh, playbook with with vagrant boxes around that we would be able to the hardware that we're using is uh, they have a uh, thing called Duffy where you essentially just request a box you get a 32 you get a box with 32 gigs of RAM um, eight core processor and then um, what we're kind of doing right now is we're just using what forklift already does which is just boot up some vagrant boxes and then run tests in between them. Mm. So mm. I imagine that if you were able to make that scenario locally with some vagrant boxes, we could run it on there too, yeah. Yeah, I would imagine you probably want to do some kind of nested virtualization so you could actually, because you don't want to mess with anything else on the same subnet as the actual box, right? But if you could get it yeah. on an internal network, that would that should be fine. Yeah. Cool. Now, it's something we talked about years ago was trying to do like actual pixie testing because we make a big deal out of our bare metal provisioning, but we never actually test it. <laughs> Um, and I think this links back into what I was saying at the beginning about the 118 test week and how we have this big long list of scenarios uh, that we'd like our users to try. And it might be worth reviewing that and seeing how many of those are portable to, to the CentOS CI system. Um, because if we're asking other people to test them, theoretically, we should probably test them too at some level anyway. I mean, some of them are going to be edge cases, you know, things like that. That's why we still have our seats, right? Because we can't test absolutely everything. But perhaps some of those cases might work yeah exactly um, so we can probably test more so that, that's just kind of what we want to do so yeah cool okay um great i don't have any other questions apart from a lot of people confused that they're not seeing any video because you're just using a black screen for your kind of profile pic and you've stopped screen sharing and everyone's like where's the video gone <laughs> apologies <laughs> no, it's not your fault. That. it's just other people not realizing that you're using a black screen which is fair enough um <laughs> but that's how it goes right okay um cool i, I don't see any other questions um so i'm gonna move along um, so thanks, Eric. That's great. I'm um, looking forward to seeing more coming out of that. If only because you know, I'm the one that keeps an eye on our rack space budget. Uh, so uh, so I'll be very glad to see that going down, and then we can use that for some other projects that I've got in mind. Cool. OK, so moving right along, it's going to be Marek. Um, I believe the first one's a fairly quick one, looking at what you put in the agenda. So tell us about this one. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, exactly, Greg, as you said, this is going to be a very short one. Um, so as you probably all know, we have a lot of settings in Foreman. And uh, what I wanted to show you is a one more that has been added recently. Um, so everyone probably knows that we have a, a system for preventing a brute force login attempt, uh, attempts. So um, after uh, several attempts, the uh, IP address is blocked for uh, five minutes, which uh, caused some problems to some of our users, especially if they were trying to test something, they just blocked their testing machine uh, and there was no way how to actually disable it or set the limit. So now there's a new option or a new setting, failed login attempts limit. So if you set it to higher number, uh, obviously you have more tries, or if you set it to zero, you just completely disable the feature and uh, well, people can try uh, logins with uh, wrong credentials. Uh, and that was really that. Yep, nice and quick. Fair enough. Useful setting. Um, so let's go on to your, your proposal then, the thing you wanted feedback on. All right. Um, so last week I've been working on something. Uh, I, there's a red mine issue uh, with five digits, but starting with one O. So quite old uh, issue. I was asking for adding a support for uh, custom reports uh, into Foreman. So um, as you know, we already have uh, a lot of, or not a lot, but uh, 
few template uh, template types in uh, Foreman. Uh, so we have partition tables, provisioning templates, and job templates. And I thought maybe we could use the same uh, engine uh, for this functionality. So um, I started working on something I, I called report templates. So I put it into a monitor report templates. And basically, if you're familiar with the templates we have, it's very similar thing. So uh, as you can see, this is the list of, of these report templates. It, they can be locked. It could be snippets. And if I create a new one, let's call it demo, it's the very same form as we know from elsewhere. And the idea is that you specify the content of the template in here. So let's say I would like to get a list of uh, all hosts um, and their IP address and their MAC address. Something as easy as that. Um, since the output is a text file, I can use uh, I can format it any way in here. Um, so normally, in provisioning template, you would do something like this. Uh, so you use ERB uh, tags. So this part is actually the Ruby code that gets evaluated during the rendering. Um, but we don't have any object like uh, host in here, because this is not template that would be rendered for, uh, for a given host. So what I'm going to do. Uh, just uh, give me a sec to finish this line so you get the idea. Um, I will add um, um, another Ruby card that will iterate over all hosts in my database. Um, so normally, I could use the, the active record syntax in here, but that's not allowed in the safe mode for a good reason. So what I added is a macro uh, load hosts, which is enabled in safe mode. I'll just keep it like that. And then you can iterate over that uh, with each record. Uh, host. So this means uh, that this line I just added here will be basically printed for each host I have in database. I just need to use the local variable in here like that. Now, if I hadn't do any typo, if I click preview, well, we can see that we have kind of a report. One thing I should probably add in here is this uh, minuses over here, so we don't get empty lines. I we'll think. So oh, yeah, uh, I get a list like that. And it still works with the safe mode. Um, what I could also do, so it's formatted a bit nicer way, I could do uh, some Ruby uh, helpers for formatting. So I could do, for example, this. Uh, so that uh, first column will be uh, 30 characters length. Um, so same way in here. So you get the idea how to format uh, such a report. Now, <clears throat> this is um, pretty powerful because you can basically render any kind of text uh, uh, format. Uh, it could be CSV, JSON, YAML, or just any custom ASCII formatted table. Um, since it's using the, the templating engine we have, um, we have auditing, uh, or we have the history for the templates. We, you could use all the macros that are available in the provisioning templates. and. Uh, Supposingly, uh, you would need more of the things like load hosts is not available in current uh, templates, but uh, we need to add more of these. Um, it can be assigned to location organization. Uh, you can use snippets, these kind of things. Uh, now, uh, let me show you one template that I already uh, added to the pull request, like something we could ship and might be useful for people. So uh, this is the template. Um, using uh, basically the same technique, but it renders CSV. Um, and uh, what I wanted to show in here, the load hosts is actually a bit more uh, more powerful than just uh, loading all the hosts from databases. Because uh, if you have like 100 thousands of hosts in your database, it would probably uh, be quite inefficient that you load all the objects. So if you, if you use this macro inside, it actually has some additional logic. So first of all, it does the authorization. So internally, it uh, only loads the host that the user that actually renders this template has a view host permissions on. The second thing is that it loads all the records in batches uh, by default uh, by 1,000 records. But you can specify parameters to this. And in here, also, I need to load additional data. So if you look at this template, what it does, it prints, again, the host name. Then it, it uh, prints the host global status which is a number which represents whether uh, the host is uh, in OK, warning, or error state. And when we iterate over all sub-statuses and print the host status 
for a given host. If you don't understand this Ruby code, it, it's not anything you have to understand. But the reason I, why I'm mentioning is that um, this would potentially load uh, or create an additional SQL query for each host and each substatus. But you can specify includes in here uh, so that it loads all the statuses uh, with the join for a given batch. Uh, and you could also specify more things. Uh, you could use this, the very same search syntax that we have on the host page. So you could do something like, oh, sorry, this template is locked, but I'm going to demonstrate it. Uh, if I create a new one, I'll just copy the same string. So you could even limit that. Or let me just show you that uh, basically you get uh, CSV with all the statuses in here represented by the number. You could always uh, change that and uh, print also text representation if you want. Um, but you could also limit that with uh, search syntax we have uh, everywhere in the format. So you could do something like name is uh, Debian. That limits the list only to three uh, three hosts I have in here, which contains Debian in the name. So. So far, I just show you how to preview the template. Uh, but in fact, you wouldn't probably uh, want to do the preview and then copy and paste it somewhere else. That's why these report templates has uh, a new action in here called render. So when I click that, it actually renders the template. Uh, so the idea is that you specify that template once and then render multiple, multiple times like that. Now, you won't see that because I'm sharing just the browser. But if I open the file, I basically get that uh, text output. So this is this is what I have so far. Um, it seems to be working quite well, um, but I plan to add more things to that. Um, so I would I would be happy to hear feedback for what you've seen in here. Um, maybe the best idea is to uh, go to that pull request. Uh, I can share the link on the IRC later. You see uh, the GIF recording in there of what you've seen here, basically. But I just wanted to mention also what I plan to to add later. So one thing I would like to add is uh, some template inputs, uh, like we know them from job templates from the remote execution plugin. And the reason is uh, we don't probably want to change the, the template content just because of uh, the searching, let's say, on the host. Like I've, I've shown you that I can search for hosts. I would need to change the template content so I get the report for a different set of hosts. So this could be actually uh, kind of extracted through the template inputs. And when I click render, I would I could specify that uh, search syntax, and that would be just injected into that uh, template. The second thing I would like to do is uh, add a support for scheduling. So I could say render this template, but during the midnight, let's say. And I would like to use uh, Dynflow for that so that it doesn't block the web process. Because right now, the rendering happens in the web process, but I would like to be able to offload it to the different process so the web application is not blocked by that. If you think about uh, huge reports, it could take a long time to, to render them. Uh, then I would like to look at uh, the most commonly asked reports and provide more DSL into the safe mode so uh, people can uh, write more things without disabling safe mode. Um, these report templates could be uh, available uh, even in the community templates repo. Uh, I was looking at uh, that possibility and the script we already have for syncing would just work out of the box. Also, uh, I need to to verify that, but most likely the Foreman templates plugin uh, already works with this kind of templates uh, because of the recent changes we, we added there. Um, and yeah, uh, I would like to provide a, a formal chapter in our manual about the macros uh, and what we can use in there and add a support in Hammer. The pull request already contains API for that, so it should be really, really easy to add uh, just a new command into the Hammer. So. That's the current plan. Uh, as Greg mentioned, this is not a merge. This is not going to be in 118 um, and most likely not even in 119. Uh, but I would like to get feedback early on um, so that uh, I can uh, do it according to your needs. And I think that's it from my side. Very cool. First piece of feedback. I love it. Um, sorry, I, this is coming from someone who just spent a little bit of time using uh, installing and using the Data Explorer plugin on uh, Discourse, which is not so far away, right? I mean, a Data Explorer is usually a direct access to the database, so you're writing SQL, but this is you know, essentially the same thing. So um, yeah, I absolutely love it. I think it's fantastic. Uh, we have had a few questions on the chat. I think you've already answered most of them. 
Um, so Ohad was talking about search filters, uh, which you covered. Uh, you said you want to do a scheduled report running like once a week or something. So uh, that's fine. Presumably, you can specify which, like a user gets to specify the, the, the regular run, right? If something's happening in the background, you've got to know which user to render as. Yeah, exactly. My plan for that was just storing the context. By the way, the load host maker also uh, uh, like uses the current context, current organization and location. Yeah, so we would need to store that, the, yeah. the context for uh, later yeah. processing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and also, there's a there's a question like how to deliver that report because right now, uh, since it happens synchronously, we just offer uh, a downloading of that file at the end when it's rendered. Uh, once it's a background operation. There are two possibilities. Yeah. Either we store it somewhere, perhaps in database, and user can download it later, or the one that I would prefer probably is just send it via email because mm -hmm. the user has to have an email address, or maybe we can specify an additional. Um, yeah, email would be would be my suggestion. I mean, when I when I compare it to the only other place I've been doing this recently, which, as I say, is Discourse, what that does is something we can't easily do because we don't have the infrastructure. But it sends me a, a private message right with the file attached to it, and then that also results in an email as well. So. Either way, but um, but yeah, uh, that email seems to make the is the obvious one, I think. Um, but yeah, notification is a possibility as well. Uh, what else? I'm just seeing. Uh, Stephen was asking whether you could reuse the uh, the the table printing that we already have in Hammer uh, for for nice nice printing, or maybe using it as a helper. Um, this kind of thing. So, yeah. Um Basically, if we have that as a dependency of a foreman, uh, because right now this is part of a foreman core or it's meant to be uh, a part of a core. So as long as we put mm, a library for ASCII formatting, maybe, uh, mm -hmm. then it's fine. And to be honest, with Hammer, I think there is there is some gem used, but uh, with some custom fixes, uh, which are not part of the library. Uh, uh, but maybe it's time to rebundle that and then use it in foreman core. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Cool. Well, I mean, it's it's lovely. Um, I can see so many uses for that already. Uh, so um, definitely post. I mean, I, I don't know whether you already have. I might have missed it. Um, but if you haven't already put something about that on the forum, I absolutely would. And, and then maybe link to this video as well so that people can give you feedback there because um, it seems like something that would be popular. OK, we'll do. Cool. Uh, OK, yes. Thank you, Ari. That, that's, yeah, I'm just sitting here. My mind is now full of possibilities. Uh, but enough possibilities. Let's talk about realities. Um, so next up, we have uh, a couple of videos. Uh, Ido uh, can't make it today, but he sent me a couple of videos to show you about some things he's been doing. Uh, so I'm going to attempt to show those. As usual, this is a bit of a dodgy process where I play a video really loudly and then unplug my headphones. Uh, so hopefully this works. Uh, and we'll we'll see how it goes. So let me uh, let me switch my screen sharing over to. Whoop, I've got my video on. Hi guys, how you doing? Let's try that again. Uh, let's see. We want VLC, and I'm gonna get this playing. Here we go. And kickstart. Hello. Today I want to talk about. A long overdue feature that they have released a long time ago, uh, which supports live image inside Kickstart. If you don't know, let me just uh, enter the template and I will show you. As you can see, uh, it's a normal template, uh, like always, but when we do install, we can tell it to use uh, using host browse, uh, the live image, where the live image is actually another uh, host browse, which name uh, kickstart uh, live image, or you can change it if you want to in your tablet. This change actually uh, started a long time ago and released a long time ago by me. Uh, and as I said, it's a long overdue uh, during this uh, introduction. There were several changes that I introduced in this, uh, for example, a repository URL helper, which actually knows how to calculate uh, the URL based on a given path. Uh, it's part of Catello and not forming core. Uh, this calculation actually knows how to take uh, information 
regarding the path that were uh, configured inside Catello and translated to the proper path. Uh, please note that it supports SquashFS files. Uh, so if you don't know SquashFS files, um, as you read about it, they are actually for live image uh, format. Uh, they provide read-only uh, file system with the uh, Intel Linux and uh, all the bootable uh, requirement for a disk called a uh, disk on key to be able to boot. Uh, this is my first feature that I wanted to talk about. I also wanted to talk about uh, a bug fix that I created uh, for a uh, code execution. The bug uh, was in the API, uh, the structure of the API was wrong. Uh, so when we wanted to update the current user to an effective user that will actually execute the code, we didn't set, store that information and we couldn't actually update the affected uh, current user using the API. As you probably know, Hammer uses the API, so even Hammer didn't work. So now, after I fixed it, uh, it works, but the structure was a bit, was changed a bit. We have to just execute it. And we'll see. Okay, what do we have here? As you can see, the parameters are as follows. We have the template, uh, we have the category, provider, everything that hasn't changed a bit. But we used to have here uh, the effective user, the effective user attributes, uh, an SSH uh, key, which actually was uh, an object that handles inside the effective user. The thing is that the structure of the Rex does not support the SSH key. It was only introduced at the API, but not at every, anywhere else. So what I did was removing the SSH uh, parent and using just the effective user attributes and that actually fixes the bug. So now you can see the code itself. Um, we used to have here a param SSH and so on and now it's gone. So please note about it and enjoy working with the API. Thank you. Okay, let me put my headphones back in. So uh, that was two videos there from Ido on, on updates from him. And uh, obviously he's not here, so he can't answer questions. Uh, hopefully you could hear and see those okay um, once I got the uh, thing actually uh, maximized properly and so on. Uh, so that was that was live image and, and Rex API bug fixes from Edo. And then finally, uh, there's me. Uh, so I'm going to screen swap screen sharing again. I want to give you a little update um, on a couple of infrastructure things. Uh, one I didn't include on the slide, um, but I think is new since the last demo. Uh, I, I've hooked up the blog to uh, to discourse. So the blog comments on on the form are now powered by discourse. This is good. This means people can comment on our blog posts if they want to. Um, and it also uh, provides some visibility of the blog uh, on discourse itself. Uh, let me actually uh, screen share here and then we can we can actually have a bit of a look about what I'm talking about. Um, so I've got this here. I'm just going to go over to community.forman.org uh, while we have a quick talk about this. So We've now got this uh, blog category down here, and it's got all the blog posts in it, which means people tracking the uh, uh, the forum will see the blog posts who might not have been aware of it. So this cross-pollination is a good thing. Um, and if you come in here, you'll find uh, that you know there's a link to the original blog post on here, and you can go and have a look. And if we go to the bottom, there's this comments from the community section. Um, let me find one that's actually got some comments. That would help. Uh, what about this one? Uh, so if I link through to, to the blog and go to the bottom, you can see this gets nicely rendered. 
Um, one reply from Toma, yada, yada, yada. Although, why it's not showing all of it, I'm not entirely sure. Oh, it's probably because I'm not. Well, that's, I need to investigate that. But anyway, the only downside to this is that it has caused um, all of these posts to be created. Um, so if you've been spammed by blog posts from like five years ago, I apologize. It's a one-off thing. The first time the page is loaded, it creates the entry here in Discourse. Um, so yeah, um, this has caused a certain amount of, of blog spam. Um, there's something like 70 posts in Discourse. There's only about 100 on the blog, so it's mostly done. Um, yeah, it's not a huge amount of volume, so yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, but it's worth, it's worth the pain, is all I'm trying to say. Now, speaking of things that are worth the pain, I also want to talk about Redmine. <laughs> Now, Redmine has been, uh, shall we say, busy uh, over the last week. Um, last time we had a demo, I quickly demonstrated my plan for what we were going to do to get Redmine upgraded. Uh, and over the last two weeks, that has been happening. Uh, and as of right now, um, we are pretty much ready to do the actual upgrade to Redmine itself. That is, backlogs is gone. Uh, the plugin that was blocking us is gone, and lots of changes have happened under the hood uh, in order to help us kind of do things more effectively. And I just wanted to walk you through a couple of those changes. Um, so the first thing is, as I say, backlogs is gone. That means uh, that if you look at any particular issue, you don't have the release fields anymore. Uh, so let's just pick one. I'm just going to go down here and pick a recent one. Here we go. Right, so you can see that in this section here, we don't have this kind of release story, backlog type, all that kind of stuff. Likewise, if you edit, you don't see it here either. Those are gone, and everything is now under the target version field. You can see here we've got the currently open versions of Foreman. So this has been cleaned up substantially. All of the sprint integration, backlog type, field, uh, type versions, in quotes, because they weren't really versions, have been removed. Um, and these have been create, created to hold what was in the release category before. We've also added two new fields. We've got fixed in releases and found in releases. Now, the thinking here is that you really want three things. And two of them are historical, and one of them is a future statement. So target version is a future statement. It says, we would like to release uh, a fix for this issue in 1.19 assuming it gets written in time, right? So this is a future prediction. It's not necessarily accurate. You can end up with releases closed, with issues open, and all that kind of stuff, right? It's a, it's a, it's a guess. These ones are historical. The idea here is that a user can say, I found this bug in 1.15, uh, and then someone else can come along and say, well, I also found it in 1.16, uh, and it was still present in 1.17 as well. So this is a multi-select field, and you can say where it was found. Likewise, when we cherry pick things, you can say, well, we fixed this in 1.19, but we're backporting it to 1.18. So this is a multi-select thing as well. But these are both historical. These both represent things that were done with the code and with the bug. And the idea is you can use these fields in different ways to report uh, where we found it, how we fixed it, when we'd like to fix it. They're all slightly different. Now, we're still figuring out exactly how this workflow is going to work, uh, but that's the basic idea. Now, these target versions um, are project specific. So if I go to, let's pick a uh, Catella bug. That's uh, because I have to put project in here. Oh, yeah, there we go. So if I pick a Catella bug and I edit that, uh, you'll see the target version only has Catella versions in here. And likewise, these ones are here as well. Now, these, uh, unlike the old found in Catello release field that we used to have here. This is not a hard-coded list. It pulls directly from the version field. Uh, so as we add more open versions, these fields will update automatically. So you don't need an admin to go and add new releases for you. There is a downside, however. In order to make sure that this box wasn't completely spammed with Foreman versions, because Foreman's the top-level project, we had to unshare the projects, uh, the versions from each project. So let me show you what that means. Uh, if I go to... Um, Projects uh, roadmap. These are the foreman specific versions. So you'll see 1.18, 1.19, and so on on here. Um, now, before you would have seen these versions on the sub page as well, like the proxy and Catello and all the plugins and so on. But now you don't. And the reason you don't see that is because uh, we have set this to not sharing. And if you got a whole bunch of email earlier this week uh, from like bugs from five years ago. That was me testing this unsharing process, and I apologize about that. Uh, I found a better way to do it that doesn't involve spamming everybody. Uh, now, the consequence of that means that the other core projects that are under this 
Um, so the proxy, the installer, the um, the uh, the packaging, SE Linux, the things that we all consider part of core, but are actually sub projects in Redmine, can't share versions anymore. Uh, and so what that means is that if I go and look at something like um, the packaging, so if I do RPMs uh, slash roadmap, oh, can't spell. Still can't spell because I'm not looking at my keyboard. Roadmap, there we go. So you can see there's 1.18 here, but it's not the same 1.18 that is in the top level project. It's got a different version number. Um, and that's just a consequence of, of how we've done things. Now, overall, this is really just a matter of us updating the tooling so that when we want to pull things like change logs out of Redmine, we, we know to go and look at all of the 1.18 versions. The other consequence of this is that in a handful of cases of something like about 50 bugs, you had a situation where um, a sub-project had an issue assigned to a foreman version. And in order to, to not break the associations, I had to go and create something to hold those bugs. And so what you will find is that, um, for example, Catella now has a 1.16. Uh, which doesn't match the Catella release version, right? And that's because there was a bug on 1.16, and I had to put it somewhere else in order to unshare the versions. Uh, so I wrote a big script that basically went through every single bug that shouldn't be part of a form and top-level version and created versions to hold it. Now, um, that's happened on quite a few of the projects. So I put a list. If you go to the forum and you go to my post on the development board, let me find it for you so you can see it. Uh, here we are, development. Let's get rid of that. Uh, Redmine updates. You go to the last post on Redmine updates. There's this uh, long list of projects here. These are all the projects that had at least one bug that was assigned to a Foreman version, and therefore will now have a Foreman version in its version history. Um, now, a lot of these, you expect that. You know, Smart Proxy, I expect that. Website, mm, kind of expect that. But something like Catello or you know, Ansible or Bastion, the things that have got their own re version release numbering systems, the people who own those projects might want to go and have a look through these auto-created versions that I've generated and just move those bugs to where they're supposed to be. Um, so that's where we're at. Um, there's a couple of other fields I could probably show you. Um, so if we just pick any other uh, anything here. The other one that we've added, I think it's project-wide, is this triage flag. So again, if you have a triage project, a triage process for your project, you can use this flag. Um, and there's this team backlog. This uh, comes from what we were using the target version field for before. I've added it just from a historical point of view. Um, if this isn't being used, if team leads want to get in touch with me, this isn't being used, I will remove it. I only put it in just because my understanding was that for some people this mattered. Uh, but it takes up quite a lot of space. So if you're not going to use it, let me know, and I'll delete your name from the entry. And if that list goes to zero, then I'll take the field out entirely. Uh, oh, and one other thing for Catello specifically, I would like to know, you used to have um, this founding Catello release field. Now, I don't have an audit history, but in some time in the last week, this has been unshared from the Catello project. You can see it's used by no projects now. Um, if that was deliberate or not, let me know, because I want to know if, uh, if an accident happened. And if you would like me to migrate the data that's in this field to the found and releases uh, field that we now have, then I can do that. Just let me know how uh, how you want me to play that. OK, so basically, that's where we're at with Redmine. Um, next week, I'm going to start the actual version upgrades. So I took a dump of the database yesterday and tried it on Redmine 3, and it works fine. Um, so we can get this upgraded to Redmine uh, 3, 3 point, uh, at least 3.0. I haven't tried any higher than that yet, but I have no doubt that it's probably going to be OK. OK, um, so that's where we're at with Redmine. Um, with that, I'm going to switch back to my slides. Oh, well, I'm going to check for, I'm going to check for questions first. Um, got a few, few things. Um, OK, it was deliberate, and you want me to migrate the data. I hear you. I'll get that done. Um, OK, fine. Good. Right, let me switch back to the slides then. Here we go. So that's that. Um, and that's us for today. So thank you all very much for watching. Thanks, as always, to the presenters. Uh, you can find us in the usual places. Uh, you know where the subscribe buttons are by now. Uh, in fact, I was noticing this week that uh, we have, I think we've just surpassed our Twitter followers and YouTube followers, which is quite interesting. Um, so that's kind of cool. Anyway, until next time, thank you all very much for watching, and do take care.